Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in to PNP. Oh, oh, what's this? Oh, oops. Better have a sip of coffee. <laughs> uh, forgive me for teasing you. I have a reflection today, dear ones, that I'm entitling The Soul's Journey After Death. I'm offering this uh, meditation uh, as a follow-up to my devotion last week on praying for those in hell. Remember that that reflection derived from the kneeling prayers of Pentecost, uh, which are done in the church, those three magnificent prayers, the third of which is our boldest prayer uh, for those who are uh, departed this life and in Hades. I'd like to reflect with you a little bit more on the soul's journey after death. You know, my uh, intention here is to help um, everyone who's, who's watching have a greater understanding of the serious nature of death, understanding what it is, what happens uh, to us at that time, and how the victory that we have uh, in Jesus by being attached to him, by believing in him and having faith in him as the conqueror of death, the vanquisher of Hades, how we can actually benefit from him and how he saves us uh, through this process. Myself, I was born and raised in a Protestant tradition as a Presbyterian that had a, a view of death that I discovered through uh, my reading of the scripture and of the church fathers was deficient a bit in this area of what happens uh, at the time of death. Mostly there was inserted into uh, the Protestant tradition and into particularly my tradition of Presbyterianism, which adhered to a confession called the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is a 17th century uh, Reformed confession. Uh, that confession inserted the word that you do not find actually anywhere in Scripture in association with uh, the movement of the soul at death, the word immediately. And so the Westminster Confession inserted that word immediately to describe the movement of the soul of the believer at death, evidently according to the uh, interpretation of Scripture that's offered by the Presbyterian uh, scholars. The soul doth, quote, immediately pass uh, into glory and, and to be with Christ. I'll address that uh, invention uh, in a moment. But first, let's, let's step back a bit and let's talk about the soul's departure. Death, we understand essentially as the separation of the soul from the body, something that was never intended by the Lord God. He didn't fashion us... Uh, in these parts to be broken up into pieces. This is the tragedy of death. When the soul leaves the body, the body stops being animated and uh, we recognize the person as dead. That process uh, is not always instantaneous. It's a, can be, uh, there can be a transition usually as a transition where the person's in the process of leaving uh, and begins to see the next world, but is still able to speak. Any priest of any experience who has spent time, uh, or will have spent time with many dying, and will have seen this type of thing. When the soul leaves the body, and the body itself is dead, the body is cared for uh, reverently by believers. That's the call of the church. And we care for the person's body because that body remains the person. Not all of the person, not the best part of the person, but the person nonetheless. This is why we would never dream of burning the body as though it's some worthless shell. It is not that. We, would, we kiss the body. We take care of our loved ones the way that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and the murmuring women cared for the body of our Lord Christ. We would bury uh, the person, give the person a last kiss, but we would pray for the person's soul, which begins at death the journey. If it's a Christian person, if it's a person who has received 
the sacraments of the church and has been living in communion with Christ, the person begins their movement uh, towards the kingdom of God to be rested with Christ uh, for the period between the person's death and the second coming and the universal resurrection and the great judgment, which is to come. The person begins to see with the eyes of the soul, not the body, because the bodily eyes are closed, awaiting the resurrection. But we, they begin to see with their, the eyes of their soul and to hear with the ears of their soul. <coughs> there is, in fact, no scripture that says that when a person dies and when a Christian dies, they do, quote, immediately pass into glory. Uh, there are common scriptures referred to um, and I'd like to address a couple of those. For instance, St. Paul's beautiful word in his epistle to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 23, where he says, I have the desire to depart and to be with Christ, for that is very much better. What a beautiful word. And what uh, an expression of the universal Christian ambition to move from this life to the next and to be near Christ because it is very much better uh, even than the joys of being a Christian in this life. But notice that there's no word there uh, about the speed of that movement. Paul doesn't say, I will, I have the desire to depart and immediately I will be with Christ. He makes no such affirmation. He makes the affirmation that Jesus is the movement where he's going to. He is the destination. He's where he's going. I have the desire to depart and to be with Christ, for that is very much better. But there's nothing there that would negate the idea that there is a journey, that there is a movement. Another common text referred to by those who think that when you die, boom, immediately the next second you're with Jesus, is in 2 Corinthians, St. Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 8b, where he says, we prefer to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And that is definitely the preference of all Orthodox Christians who are seeking God. We desire, we yearn and prefer to be absent from the body and to be present or at home with the Lord. That is, uh, we're affirming that as much as we rejoice in our union with Christ now, as much as we participate in a closeness to God now that we seek, we know it's only going to get better. That for us, uh, we want to be near God. We, that is our true home, uh, is to be there. And we, even though we're moving into this uh, difficult state through death, we know that it's a state moving towards God and moving towards to be closer to God. Of course, it's not the end. The end will be the resurrection of our bodies and our being reunited with our bodies and becoming whole again and established in that condition to be with God forever in a perpetually deepening communion, St. Gregory the Theologian says. But notice once again that this is Paul's affirmation of his preference to move from this life to the next. There is no reference here to immediacy. There is nothing in this text that would negate the church's traditional understanding of the, it being a process uh, supported by the prayers of our brothers and sisters in the church, conducted by the holy angels, uh, involving important uh, matters as we move from this life to the next. There's a third text that comes from the 23rd chapter of St. Luke's Gospel that is appealed to by those who are making an affirmation that um, there's an immediacy uh, that would negate uh, any need for praying for the person, uh, or and would negate any concept of uh, journey. And that comes from uh, Jesus' words to the thief on the cross uh, in Luke chapter 23, verses, verse 43. Uh, this whole account uh, is often appealed to for a number of crazy ideas. Um, one is that... Our, uh, is, an, is the idea that somehow believers don't need to be baptized because the thief was saved without baptism. Of course he was because baptism didn't exist yet. <laughs> Christian baptism awaited uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so this uh, man 
it appears, had uh, as a uh, Jew, had the prototypes, the, the types from the Old Testament of uh, baptism in circumcision. But uh, he didn't have Christian baptism, baptism yet because the Holy Spirit had not yet come and the church had not yet begun uh, its great work of preaching and baptizing the nations. So that is uh, a worthless text to appeal to, to suggest that people now in the Christian age uh, don't need baptism to be saved. That's not what the text is saying. Also, some appeal to Jesus' affirmation that today the thief will be with him in paradise as though... Uh, that means that all believers throughout Christian history, at the second that they die, immediately are uh, in paradise and that there is no journey of the soul. Uh, in fact, if you would read A.A. Uh, a. Hodge's commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith in the chapter on death, I think it's the 32nd chapter, he cites this very text. Unfortunately, this text does not support that idea Remember what's going on here. Our Savior is in uh, on the cross, and he is about to plunder Hades. <laughs> and he is about definitively to take the thief and to rescue his soul and every other soul that will be rescued by Christ and will have Christ as a Savior, but has been bound in Hades. He's about to go there and take them all uh, as he leads captivity captive to his own love, freeing them from the grip of the devil and death and bringing them up uh, with him into heaven. So uh, don't confuse the definitive historical plundering of hell with uh, uh, the idea that the second any believer dies who confesses Christ, they are with uh, Jesus in paradise and that there is no journey of the soul. In fact, uh, St. Augustine, in one of his sermons, comments, on this very text, and I'd like to, to read it with you. He says, Recognize to whom you are commending yourself. You believe I am going to come, but even before I come, I am everywhere. That is why, although I am about to descend into hell, I have you with me in paradise today. You are with me and not entrusted to someone else. You see, my humility has come down to mortal human beings and to the dead, but my divinity has never departed from paradise. So here, St. Augustine, referring to the commenting on the, the words of Christ uh, about the thief being with him in paradise, is affirming that you are going to be with me, and to be with me means to be in paradise. So he was going to participate with Christ. Uh, as the thief died, his soul uh, was going to be one of those souls ransomed and redeemed by Christ in his great uh, plundering of hell. But the text can't be used, sorry, to negate the idea of the journey of a soul. The church teaches that what will happen at death will be uh, the expression of the yearning of the person in this life. If they gravitate and are oriented towards Christ, bound to Christ by faith, joined to him in baptism, nourished by his body and blood throughout the course of their life, seeking first the kingdom of God, this is what we consider a normal Christian. This is a normal Christian life. And for the normal Christian, death is a movement from Christ to more Christ. And it, we gravitate with the holy angels. That's natural for us. If we've lived with the angels, we've respected our angel. We respect holiness. We won't be shocked uh, for us all to see the angels. Some even see their angels in this life. We'll gravitate towards that which we have gravitated towards in this life as we move to the next life. And of course, it works the opposite way. For Christians who are Christians in name only, who confess Christ with their mouth but love the things of the earth, for them it will be complete torture uh, because they'll be leaving by death that which they really worship and what they really are seeking, which is uh, the earth and the things of the earth. And when you are forced uh, into death, which no man can stop, uh, it's complete torture. So we gravitate at death and in the moments after death, we gravitate towards that which we have been gravitating towards in life. The good case scenario is that uh, the believer who loves Christ has the great delight of being closer and closer to him at death. This is what we would consider to be the normal Christian life. There happens to be a beautiful and very like, canonically important 
text from the life of St. Anthony the Great. Remember, the life of St. Anthony is a paradigm of spiritual life for the church for the last 1,700 years. He is uh, what we think uh, the model of uh, devotion, the model of devotion. And he had an experience, uh, a very shocking experience of the journey of the souls. And I'd like to read it from you. I'll read it to you, rather. Listen to this. Later, when once he had had a conversation with someone who visited him about the soul's passage and its location after this life, the next night, someone called to him from above saying, Anthony. Now, recognize the, the scenario here, the setting. He's being visited by a pilgrim, St. Anthony the Great is, as he was constantly. And the person is asking St. Anthony about our subject. What happens to the soul after death? And where, does, where do the souls go and how do they move? And the very next night, he hears, St. Anthony hears someone calling his name. Anthony, get up, go out and look. And going out, therefore, for he knew whom he would benefit from obeying, and looking up, he saw someone huge and ugly and fearsome, standing and reaching to the clouds, and certain beings ascending as if they had wings. And the huge figure extended his hands, and some were being held back by him, but others flying upwards and finally passing him by, ascended without anxiety. What a scene. This massive, black, ugly, hideous beast is in the air. All these souls are moving up like they have wings. And he's trying to grab them all and throw them down. And some just without any problem at all and without any anxiety, it says. That's a very important text. Without any anxiety, are just passing him by. But others are being hindered. That great one gnashed his teeth over those latter, over the people who he couldn't restrain. Really upset him. But over those who fell back, he rejoiced. And immediately a voice came to Anthony. Understand what you have seen. And his understanding was opened. And he comprehended that it was the passage of the souls. And that the huge figure was the enemy who envies the faithful. And he perceived that he seizes and prevents the passing of those who are under his authority. But he is incapable of seizing, as they pass upwards, those who did not submit to him. Having seen this then and being prompted to recollection, he was striving more each day to advance to what lies ahead. Look at that, would you? This is the journey of the soul. It's a movement towards Christ. And notice that the believers who moved without anxiety towards Christ and were able to defeat and pass by this ugly, hideous Satan were those who did not submit to him in this life. So, dear ones, let us, uh, like St. Anthony, respond to this vision, to this knowledge, by striving ever more for the kingdom of God making it our chief ambition, making the love of Christ supreme in our life and the acquisition of his kingdom. And then we won't have to be in terror. And we won't have to make up fake stories about how it's all going to be easy <laughs> at death. It's not. It's not. Instead, let's trust Christ as our champion. And then without anxiety, we'll pass by those terrible Beasts. May this be God's gift to us in his great mercy. Amen. I believe in one God, Father of all. Now available at patristicnectar.org. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a five part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum entitled the Nicene Creed, an introduction. The Nicene Creed is the singular and universal statement of faith of the one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. It possesses complete authority in the Orthodox Church and is recited in every divine liturgy and daily in the prayers of the faithful. In these lectures, the Christian faith is summarized 
and the content of the creed itself is examined so that the faith once delivered to the saints can be known, embraced, and lived. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.